Welcome from the ACLS Certification Institute, found at www.aclscertification.com. In this video, we're going to continue with Pediatric Advanced Life Support, and this one's on monitoring and vascular access. And this video is based on Part 14, Pediatric Advanced Life Support from the 2010 American Heart Association Guidelines for CPR and Emergency Cardiovascular Care from the journal Circulation. And we're going to be looking at the evidence behind which monitors should we be placing on our patients and what kind of what can we do for vascular access. So let's start with cardiac monitoring or electrocardiography. Uh, namely here we're talking about continuous monitoring. So that when, when you put them on a monitor and you have a waveform here. And they recommend that this is actually very helpful in uh, identifying rhythms as well as tracking any changes that might happen due to your treatment. And so cardiac mo monitoring is definitely recommended. Uh, an electrocardiogram, a 12 lead electrocardiogram, will probably have to wait until your patient is a li little bit more stable. The next mention, uh, echocardiography. Echocardiography, and that's when you place an ultrasound on the patient and you're going to get a, a picture of their heart. And at this point, they say that there is really not enough evidence to recommend the routine use of echocardiography. Now, this can be useful in determining reversible causes of, uh, and potentially treatable causes of arrest, things such as pericardial tamponade and other things that's going to uh, decrease ventricular filling. But you're going to have to have someone who is skilled in this procedure, and you've got to make sure that placing this probe on the chest does not affect delivering good CPR, good chest compressions. Next, we're going to look at end tidal CO2 detection or capnography, continuous capnography. And what that is, is you, if you have a patient who is intubated, you can attach an uh, electrode, not an electrode, uh, some sort of measurement device to the endotracheal tube, and it's going to measure the concentration, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And so you can see here it's the partial pressure, that's what the P is, and tidal CO2. This is not an ad for Petco. And this will give you a waveform like this. As you exhale CO2, it goes up, and when you inhale, it goes back down. And you exhale, it's going to register CO2. As you inhale, it doesn't register CO2. Now, there's a couple of ways that this could be useful. And so I've drawn a couple of different uh, waveforms here, and we're going to talk about each one. So using capnography, you could tell how good the chest compressions are that are being delivered. And you could also tell if somebody got their pulse back without having to check a pulse. And that's important because we know that we are very bad at checking for pulses. So this first waveform here, if you are not breathing, you're not going to be exhaling any CO2, and so you'll have a flat waveform on the monitor. So a value of zero millimeters of mercury, uh, of the pressure of carbon dioxide, that represents apnea. Now, let's say you, you have that, they're not breathing, they have no pulse, so you start doing chest compressions. And good chest compressions will generate a waveform that looks like this. So a value of 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury uh, on exhalation, that represents good compressions. So if 10 to 15 is good compressions, then anything less than that, less than 10, well, that would represent bad compression. So if you see on the monitor, on the end tidal CO2 monitor, a very uh, small waveform like this, then you know that your chest compressor is tired and you need to switch that person out because they're not doing a good job. Now, nothing is going to pump blood through the circulation as well as the person's own native heart rhythm. So what would be better than good comp chest compressions? Well, the person's own heart beating. So a value of 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury represents return of spontaneous circulation. So at that point, you could actually stop doing chest compressions and feel for a pulse, and you should feel one because not, no chest compressions are going to give you this good a waveform. Only the person's own heartbeat is going to do that. So end tidal CO2 monitoring, well, that gets a big check too. That's a good thing to do. At this point in the paper, they start talking about vascular access. That is, how do you get fluids and medications in the patient? Well, you need to have some sort of access. 
to their cardiovascular system. And getting an IV, a peripheral IV in a kid or an infant, especially in an emergency, is very, very difficult. So don't spend a lot of time doing it. Let the nurses try or go ahead and try uh, to, to get that IV in. But if you're unable to, don't waste a lot of time. We have other options. And one of the other options is a thing called the intraosseous line. And so what I've drawn here is a handheld drill. It's called the EZIO. And what you do with this thing is you take it and you basically just drill it in. You push the trigger and then within seconds that line's going to go in and you can take the drill away. And now you have a functioning line over here. And you could give medications through that. You could draw blood through this thing. And so what's going on here is you're actually drilling into the bone and into the bone marrow over here. And so this line is actually going into through the cortex of the bone and into the marrow. So it can be hard to push through. So you might want to put the IV, the, have the IV fluids go through a pump to push the IV fluids and any medications into the marrow and then it eventually gets, it actually gets right into the bloodstream. This will save you in a pinch. This thing is actually very easy to use if you have the proper training. And the training's not that difficult, so it's worth learning how to use it. And this replaces a uh, central IV axis, which is putting a, uh, a catheter into one of the bigger veins in the body, such as the femoral vein, subclavian vein, uh, intrajugular vein, because that takes a lot of time to do. And you don't have a lot of time during a code. The only time that I can think of that you could put, you'll be putting a central line into a patient is in newborns, when you have access readily available the umbilical vein is sitting there waiting for you to, pu to put a catheter in it. Other than that, go to the I.O. So getting the vascular access, however you're going to do it, getting a peripheral line or getting a, an I.O., well, that gets, that gets a check. That's something worth doing. And the final thing they talk about in this section is using the endotracheal tube. That is, if you have the patient intubated already, you can give drugs through there. And that's what we used to do. We used to squirt the drugs into the uh, endotracheal tube and give them a few breaths, and it would absorb in through the lungs. Now, the only problem with that is we have no idea how much is actually getting into the bloodstream, how much of it got stuck in the throat, how much of it got stuck in the airways, and how much got stuck in the lungs. And so we were just kind of really guessing on it. You would use 10 times a dose of epinephrine, 2 times a dose of lidocaine, and this mnemonic here, Lean, L-E-A-N. Those are the drugs that you could give through the endotracheal tube, and that stands for lidocaine, epinephrine, atropine, and naloxone. So those are the ones that work when given through here, and they just basically will be breathing it in. So this was our video on monitoring and vascular access in the Pediatric Advanced Life Support. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Have a good day.